Welcome back to We Want Picks. I'm Artem MMA, and I'm going to be predicting every fight on the PFL Europe 4 2023 Championships card, which is going to be very similar to the PFL finals that we had just a few weeks ago, except this is for the PFL's European part of the promotion. PFL Europe is PFL, but it almost operates as if it is a completely different promotion because they do separate events to the standard PFL ones that do take place in the USA. The winners of the finals of this tournament here will be competing for $100,000, but also the opportunity to be part of the PFL's main roster and then compete in that tournament for $1 million. So there is still quite a bit on the line. There's a lot of money on the line for these fighters that have made it this far. And it should be a good card because the PFL does actually have a very talented European roster and a lot of fun fights should come out of this card. They've signed quite a few guys from Bellator. Or I guess I could say they've acquired a few guys from Bellator that will be fighting on this card. So definitely quite a bit to look forward to when it does come down to this card. But before I do get into my predictions for the whole card, you do have the We Want Picks 3-day free trial if you do sign up using my code ARTEM. But aside from that, it is $10 per month and you get so much value, everything that is below me there. And more, you get my articles every single week. And you get articles from, I believe, three other channels right now, as well as the AI Picks and Jacob and Angelo's Premium Insight. There's so much there, $14 per month, but you can get a three-day free trial. Cancel at any time, even during the three days if you sign up using the code ARTEM. And with all of that being said, let's get into my predictions for the PFL Europe 2023 Championships. So kicking off the card, they are actually starting the event with an amateur fight between a fighter that is 1 and 2 and a fighter that is 1 and 3. And to be honest with you, I just decided not to bother really looking into that one. I just don't think that's fight that's really worth breaking down or betting on at all. It's two amateurs with losing records. So let's just get into the, the professional part of the card, I guess you could say. It's going to be Connor Hughes taking on Sebastian Santana Guedes. And both of these guys are very big for 155 pounds. Connor Hughes stands at 5 foot 11, but he does fill out that frame quite well. And Sebastian Santana is 6 foot. But he is a bit of a thinner six foot, I guess you could say. Now, Connor Hughes, if you watch his regional fights where he is fighting guys, which he's a lot bigger than, and guys that, to be honest, just aren't really on his level, he looks incredible, man. And then he comes into this fight against Dylan Took on PFL, and he looks pretty good in the first round. But round two and round three, Dylan Took gets the takedowns. He gets the wrestling going. He's able to get on the back of Hughes, and Hughes just can't really escape the position. He loses the decision two rounds to one, I believe, on all three judges' scorecards. A little bit of a sad moment because I thought Hughes was going to be a pretty good prospect. He's got a big-time kickboxing and karate background, and um, I thought that he could go pretty far. I still think he can, but that was a bit of a step back for him. He's taking on Sebastian Santana Guedes, who is a grappler with not the best cardio. On the feet, I'm pretty confident that Connor Hughes is going to be the much more dynamic striker. And Santana is a guy that wants the fight to get down to the ground. Most of his wins are by submission, but he doesn't really have the best wrestling to get there. So he does kind of shoot blind takedowns pretty often. And if he can't get them, he eventually does slow down and he can gas out. And he did gas out in his last PFL fight where he took on this guy called Anat Anatoly Jabal. And he was just trying to get the takedown over and over again. Eventually, Baal gets on top of him in the second round. And Guedes has nothing left. And he finishes the fight there. I think that the Connor Hughes is going to be the much better striker. But he needs to keep this fight on the feet. I believe that he should be able to keep the fight on the feet. And I think they should be able to find a KO late in the fight. I'm thinking like round two. Maybe even round three finish for Connor Hughes. Much better striker. Much more dynamic striker. Hughes throws a lot of kicks as well. It definitely comes from that karate background that he does have. Kicks to the leg. Kicks to the body. Very dynamic. Very fast. If he can get comfortable on the feet and get going. He should be able to roll over Sebas later on into the matchup. Now we've got a fight which is just very odd. It's Kakadze Bondo taking on Dominic Wooding. And Dominic Wooding is a fighter that I am quite familiar with. I have covered him a few times in the past as he has had a pretty lengthy Cage Warriors career. And he was rumored to be on Dana White's Contender Series in 2022, I believe. But he had some sort of contract dispute or something along those lines. So unfortunately that didn't happen. But Dominic Wooding is a guy that just can knock people out. And that is what he quite likes to do. He's got nine wins. He's got nine wins by KO as well. And he was on a very, very good run before he did run into Michel Martignoni. He's a very good fighter out of Italy. 
He knocked out Carlos Abreu, who's a solid fighter, but some of his better wins did come over Nathan Fletcher and Cameron Hardy there. Fights that he wasn't expected to win either. He was 6-4 and four at the time. Went on a great run. Potentially could have made it into the UFC, but here he is in the PFL. A dynamic striker. Can be a little bit wild, but he's got that power and he just likes to land big shots. Kakadze Bondo. This is what makes the fight so interesting for me. He hasn't fought a fight in almost four years. And he hasn't really beaten anyone of note at all. I believe a lot of these fights that he was taking on were um, in China for WLF Wars. I couldn't really find a lot of tape on him. But what I did see, he just kind of seems like a wrestler that likes to get on top and just dominate on top. So maybe it's a bad stylistic matchup for Dominic Wooding. But at the end of the day, Bondo hasn't fought for four years. And he does lost to Shay Landro and Becky, which is a good loss. But the wins that he has are just not over the best competition. If Wooding keeps this fight on the feet, I'm pretty confident he's going to knock out Bondo. But four years away, I mean, how do we really know how good he or bad he's going to look? But Wooding, it should be a good fight for him. I think he's going to get a knockout. Should get his name out there for the PFL Europe audience. And I think that we should see him hopefully do some pretty big things in the PFL in 2024. And now we can move on to Tom Breeze taking on Clayton Silva. And this matchup is very interesting because of the weight class. Tom Breeze and Clayton Silva will be fighting against each other at 170 pounds. And if you go through Tom Breeze's career, recently he has been doing a lot of fights at middleweight. And even a couple fights at a catch weight of like 200 pounds. And even some light heavyweights fights as well. And I looked through it, and I'm pretty confident that the last time Tom Breeze fought at 170 pounds was in 2016 when he fought Sean Strickland, who is now the middleweight champion of the UFC. So kind of funny how things kind of roll around. Breeze has been, um, since he was released from the UFC, he has fought for quite a few promotions. Most notably, he did fight a couple of times in the KSW. Fought some good guys there. Then fought a guy, I guess, on the regional scene. And now... He's back in the PFL, taking on Clayton Silva, who's been signed from Brave CF. Clayton Silva's an older guy, but his style is very interesting to me, because he is very tall, but he's also quite slim for 170 as well. But the reason why I bring that up is just because Tom Brees is uh, going to be a bit taller than him, and Tom Brees is just bigger than him as well. Clayton Silva's recently been fighting at 170, but also at 165 pound fights as well, so... It's going to be interesting to see the size difference in this one here. Silver is definitely more of a striker. He's got a very awkward style. That Muay Thai style where he kind of holds his arms out quite long. And when his arms aren't really extended, they're by his waist. He keeps his hands very, very low. But as we know with Tom Brees, he's not the most of a striker. He's definitely more of a grappler. Most of his wins are by submission. He's going to want to get this fight down to the ground. Clayton Silva did defend a couple of takedowns against guys, which I would say probably aren't as good at wrestling as Tom Brees and won't have the same size as Tom Brees. I mean, he took on this guy from Leonardo Mafra, who fought with a very, very um, aggressive shooter box sort of style. He was a lot smaller than Clayton Silva, and he was able to get Clayton Silva down at least one time. I think Tom Brees does as well. And I think Tom Brees wins by submission in this one here against an older fighter in Clayton Silva. So give me Brees to win by submission in round number one or round number two. And now Brett Johns is going to be taking on David Turner to Kroll. And <laughs> I'll be honest, I was actually a lot more impressed with David Turner to than I expected him to be because he is... Honestly, a much better fighter than, than, than I really um, expected when I was going in to watch the tape. So David, he has a karate base, but most of his wins are by submission. And all of his losses, I believe, except for one, are by decision. So if this guy's going the distance, he's not really going to win the decision. And when you do watch his fights, you can understand why. He is not a, a minute winner if that makes sense. Like, he's not a guy that's spending a lot of time on top position. He's not a, lot, a guy that's throwing a lot of volume, just kind of doing things that look good in the judge's eyes. He's kind of the opposite. He spends quite a bit of time with his opponents on top of him, and he's trying to throw up submissions to escape the position. But if he can't throw up a submission or get a guillotine or something to try and get up from bottom control, he uh, 
he can't stand up. So he needs to use his defensive submissions to stand up. He did that against Asilda Buduev, which was a good fight, except for maybe the last half of the first round. In that one there, Asilda cracks him with a big overhand right and then gets him with a head kick. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, that's why he hasn't been finished. Because David has a chin on him, man. But then Asilda gets the fight down to the ground and controls it for about two and a half minutes. Round two, Asilda comes out there again, lands the big overhand right, gets the takedown on David. But David ends up getting up to his feet, using a guillotine to reverse his position, and then takes Asilda down. But Asilda maybe just didn't necessarily know what to do in the position because he completely gave up his back and his neck trying to stand up. So David just submitted him with a rear naked choke in the second round. But David Kroll, his karate is actually pretty good. His striking's pretty good. He's not the biggest for this weight class, but neither is going to be Brett Johns, I would say. But we all know what Brett Johns is, which is why I talked about David so much more, because Brett fought for the UFC quite a few times, and then he moved over to Bellator. He ended up losing to Danny Sabatello, which was a little bit of a disappointment, but I guess Danny Sabatello become quite popular off the win. And then he took on a couple of other pretty decent guys. But what Brett Johns is is he's a wrestler that just gets a lot of takedowns, man. One of his fights in the UFC, he got 11 takedowns. I believe he got six takedowns against a very good wrestler and a guy whose name has slipped my mind. He got six takedowns against Tony Gravely, who's a very good wrestler in his own right. When it comes to this matchup, David is going to be dangerous, but at the end of the day, I think Brett Johns has the style to stay safe. A lot of grinding against the cage and just takedowns up against the cage not giving David the space to work, I think, would be the game plan for Brett Johns to win this one here. On the feet, it could be interesting, as David actually is a pretty solid striker, in my opinion. He's just not very good defensively, like, at all, to be honest. But offensively, he looks good, but I guess so does everyone. I think Brett Johns should be able to dominate, though, using his wrestling, using his top control. It's probably going to be a boring decision if Brett does win, because I think he's going to do a lot of grinding against the cage. Get the takedown to just not give David the space to work submissions, throw up submissions, or anything like that. So give me Brett Johns to win by decision in this matchup here. The next fight is Andreas Binder taking on Daniel Scatizzi. And I believe that Daniel Scatizzi might have been one of those fighters that the PFL did acquire from Bellator. As he did fight for Bellator quite a few times before now making his debut in the PFL. Taking on a guy that is also making his debut in the PFL, Andreas Binder. And this is a fight which my pick has swapped over and over and over again. If you guys are a little bit unfamiliar, I do not have the best track record picking Daniel Scatizzi fights. I feel like this guy wins fights he's just not meant to, and then loses fights, which I think he's got a pretty good chance at winning. Now, the way that Scatizzi does fight is different for a lot of other fights, if that makes sense. Like, sometimes you go out there with a wrestling sort of game plan like he did against Davy Gellin, and then sometimes you'll try and strike like he did in his last fight against Dimitri. Who really knows what Scatizzi's really going to get up to? But one thing I do know is that he probably shouldn't go out there and try and wrestle like he did against Davy Gellin, because Andreas Binder does have a genuine sort of judo background because if you do look at his nickname it is judoka but i was actually very impressed with some of the judo throws that he was able to pull off especially against chris stringer chris stringer went out there i believe it must have been in the first or the second round and he tried to get a takedown on andreas binder and binder just like flipped him with a massive judo toss it was huge it was super impressive on the feet Binder seems a little bit tentative, but I think that when he does get the wrestling going and he does get top control, that's when he's at his best. Both of these guys are pretty good size for 155 pounds, but I do like at the moment Binder, the, I'm so, so torn on this fight. I mean, this is a fight that could go either way. I mean, Andreas Binder hasn't really fought the best competition in the world. Aiden Lee's a good fighter, but, you know, not, not the best record. He hasn't really tested himself too much he did beat Ross Ackman who was a former UFC fighter which is a good win about a year and six months ago but I think this is a fight just to not bet at all I think to stay away just watch this fight I think that there's better fights to make money on this is not the one I am picking Binder I believe he is still the underdog as the betting odds suggest but I guess a lot of people on Tapology are probably just looking at the records and picking Binder Skatizzi's beaten good fighters in the Bellator he's lost to good fighters in Bellator 
but I'm going to go with Binder. I think that Binder's style, the way that he can just slam Skatizzi if he does try and use his cage control wrestling sort of style, I think that's going to give him the edge if that sort of happens. Now we can move into Lewis McGrill and Evans taking on Wesley Meyer, and this fight is going to be a war, man. This fight, someone's getting knocked out and someone's getting knocked out in the first two rounds. I cannot wait for this matchup. It's going to be huge. If you don't know who the McRizzler is, you probably should, and you will after this fight, because he is a really, really good prospect that I wanted the UFC to sign. A lot of people wanted the UFC to sign, and he actually come up at 125 pounds, and he was massive at 125, but I don't think PFL has given him a fight at flyweight yet, so he's been fighting at bantamweight, and he's been looking pretty good doing it. The PFL is doing him right by building him up slowly, as you can see, he started off pretty slow, like, as in, like, not that he lost, he just started off fighting guys that weren't his level, knocking them out silly in the first round, comes over to the PFL, Knocks out a couple pretty decent fighters, silly, or one decent fighter, silly, in Umbrali Sadushurov in the second round. He's got power for days at 135. I think he's better off at 125, but PFL just doesn't have that weight class. Wesley Meyer is kind of similar. He's mostly a striker, but he can grapple, and he's got really good takedown defense, so this fight is absolutely going to stay on the feet for sure. If McGrillan Evans has to defend takedowns, I think he can as well. Maya's best weapon is his leg kicks. I believe he broke someone's leg in Cage Warriors with his leg kicks, but he's um, just on the feet. He's an absolute savage. He's a guy who's just going to be really tough to deal with, especially even for someone like Lewis McGrill and Evans. But Lewis McGrill and Evans is a guy that's fast. He's a former flyweight. He's super technical. He does have pretty long legs, so he, those are going to be a bit of a target for Wesley Maya's leg kicks. But if you can check those, get moving on the front foot and start landing his big shots. I think we're going to see the McGrizzler go undefeated again in the PFL and get another KO. Someone's getting slept. Whether or not it is Lewis McGrill and Evans, that remains to be seen. But it's going to be a good fight, and it's going to be a nasty finish on either side, and I cannot wait to watch this one. Give me Lewis McGrill and Evans by KO in the second round I'm going to go with. Someone's getting slept in this next matchup too. Now we have moved on to the championship fights here. We've got Jacob Nito and Simeon Powell kicking it off. These guys are going to be competing for that $100,000 and the chance to be on the PFL $1 million tournament next year. This is a tough one because my pick before we do get into the breakdown is Simeon Powell. But the confidence in Simeon Powell has decreased as I watch more and more of his tape. Because Jacob Nito is an absolute savage, man. All of his wins are in the first round. All of his wins in the last three years have been in the last two minutes. In the first two minutes of the fight, I should say. This guy's got crazy power. This guy is scary. Now, the only fighter that I saw that gave Jacob Nito any sort of trouble whatsoever was this fighter in Anthony Salomon, who just kind of got Jacob Nito up against the cage in some instances, wasn't able to take him down, but did put Nito in, I guess, positions he didn't want to be in, because he is a striker, and he wants to move forward, and he wants to throw down. Now, Simeon Powell's got a massive reach for 205 pounds, and just in general, he is 6 foot 5, with an 85 inch reach, if you do look at him though, he is a little bit slim for the weight class, but even then, Jacob Nito, despite having unreal power, isn't that big for light heavyweight himself, and Powell does fight off that jab quite well. He does throw strikes and kicks from range quite well as well. But he can mix it up, which is what I like in this matchup. But the issue that I really did have was when he took on this guy in Daniel Ladero in his last fight. And I'm pretty confident Ladero took the fight on short notice. Ladero had a lot of success when he was moving forward and putting Simeon Powell on the back foot and closing the distance. Because the way that Simeon Powell likes to fight is he likes to use that 85-inch reach, and he likes to fight behind his jab. He likes to be very patient. He's a much, much more patient fighter than Jacob Nito is, for example. And Jacob Nito's not going to allow him to be patient. He's going to be the one moving forward and putting Powell in difficult positions. And when Ladero did that, he was having success, and he was landing on Powell when he was able to blitz forward and make Powell have to retreat backwards. He had the success, so I could definitely see Nito doing that getting aggressive, moving forward in the first round, 
and landing on Powell. But the thing about Nito is we don't know how good his cardio is. We have at least seen Simeon Powell go three rounds recently. We have seen him get third round finishes as well a lot in his career. I like the fact that Powell can mix it up, you know, and I think Powell would benefit quite a bit from trying to close the distance and just push Nito up against the cage. Maybe even get some takedowns here and there, especially in round one. You need to make Jacob Nito work because this guy has unreal power, the unreal ability to knock somebody out. I do like Simeon Powell, though. I like him to pick him apart, wear him down with some wrestling, with some, with some cage control in round one, survive the early onslaught, and then work away towards the end. This is going to be a five-round fight, so maybe we see a Powell round three, four finish. I think we're going to see a late finish from Simeon Powell, but if Jacob Nito wins, it's going to be by KO in the first round. Let me know what you think of this one in the comments below, because I feel like this one could be a fight that a lot of people have their opinions divided on. Now we can move up. Dakota Jacheva is taking on Valentina Skatizzi. I might go through this one relatively quickly because the, the odds are minus 1400 for Dakota Dechiva and Valentina Scatizzi is plus 600. And Valentina Scatizzi fought a fighter that has a pretty similar style to Dakota Dechiva in all fairness in her last fight. And that fighter was against Lizzie Gavers, where Scatizzi was having success with her wrestling and was getting takedowns, especially early on into the fight. But when the fight was on the feet, Lizzie Gavarez was a lot taller than her and was able to land. But the thing about Gavarez is her striking looked pretty untechnical, like not technical, and it looked very awkward as well. Like she would throw spinning back fists when she just didn't need to. When she was throwing straight shots, they'd kind of be a bit looping. And Skatizzi just couldn't really deal with her on the feet very well. And Dakota Dechiva is an elite striker with good technique, with good power. And as long as this fight is on the feet, Valentina Skatizzi is going to be in a lot of trouble. She's going to have to get the takedowns against Dakota Dechiva. But she's a lot smaller than Dakota Dechiva is as well. And yes, I know size doesn't just equal takedown defense. But Dakota Dechiva is going to be the stronger fighter. She is going to be the bigger fighter. And she has shown to have decent enough takedown defense in the past. To the point that I think that when the fight's on the feet, and the fight will be on the feet for most of the fight, Dechiva's going to be dangerous. And one thing that Dechiva does is she knocks girls out. She's got seven wins by KO in her nine wins. She did go the distance, I believe, relatively recently. A year and eight months ago, not that recent. But she's been KOing girls ever since she went into the PFL. I think she can knock out Valentina Skatizzi. It'll be interesting to see where they go from here with her. Do they do Women's 125 in the PFL $1 million tournament? Or do they just kind of keep building her up? The truth is, they are pretty bad in her record a bit. The Chief is a really, really good fighter, but she's 9-0 fighting a girl that's 2-1 for the tournament championship. I mean, I don't know. I just don't know. That, that's kind of where I'm going to leave it. I'm picking the Chiva by KO. Now we can move on to the next one. We've got Dylan Took, the guy that did really upset Connor Hughes earlier on, taking on Yazid Trichain. And this is a close fight because Yazid Truchain isn't as good as I thought he was. Now, on paper, Yazid looks like a bit of a beast. He beat this guy that was 5-0 in Muhammad Alawi. And then he beat Yabna in Shachala, who was 9-0 at the time, and beat him by decision. And then he beat a guy that was 5-2 in the PFL. But the truth is, I'm not as impressed with Yazid as I thought I was going to be. These guys that do have the 5-0 and 10-0, and 9-0 record, sorry aren't super padded records like Yavna and Chachala had fought at least two or three decent opponents to get to that record and Mo Alawi had fought one pretty good guy before he did get knocked out by Yazid in only 48 seconds but what I like about Yazid in this matchup is he is going to have the wrestling to keep up with Dylan Took on the feet he's very low volume he's very patient I guess you could say but the way that he does get a lot of his fights done is with the wrestling and is with the top control I think you should be able to use that against Dylan Took. As I did state, Dylan Took did get his win over Connor Hughes by using the wrestling, by using the grappling. Took is a decent enough striker, and he potentially could be the better striker in this matchup because Yazid just isn't a very high-volume guy. So the fact that Yazid is a wrestler does kind of make me appeal to him, but although this is a pick and fight, I really wouldn't recommend betting on it. My pick is Yazid Trichain by decision. I think that he can get the takedowns, and I think he can maintain top control 
for long enough to just kind of win out the rounds, win a close decision over Dylan Took in this fight here. I believe most of the, yeah, most of the topology voters are with Chu Chain. I am also with Chu Chain. I do just kind of like the fact that he's a wrestler in this matchup here. In the lightweight finals, we have John Mitchell taking on Jacob Kazuba. And this is going to be a pretty close fight between two guys that do have somewhat similar styles, I guess you could say, because both guys do have wrestling as a big part of their game, except the difference really is Kazuba wrestling is his game. That is kind of all this guy really does. He went out there, I believe it was in his fight against Maxim Radu, and just shot for a takedown within like 20 seconds of the fight starting, got it, and got the submission. If you do go back to his fights that weren't in the PFL, all he's doing is wrestling and controlling fighters against the cage, which is why he's not getting a lot of dis uh, sorry, a lot of finishes over fighters that truly just aren't necessarily on his level, I guess you could say. Now, John Mitchell was a bit interesting because he fought the same guy twice to get to this point. He took on a guy in Gaysim Derocher twice, but in the second fight, Derocher did look a little bit better, but John Mitchell was able to control both the striking and the wrestling, and he was able to get takedowns, not necessarily at will, but he didn't really have a lot of resistance trying to get those done. Both of these guys are a pretty decent size for 155. I know I've said that a lot, but for some reason, this whole card is full of fighters that are pretty big for the weight class. So that's pretty interesting. But when it comes down to it, I like Jakub Kazuba just because I know that he's going to be constantly wrestling. Now, that could be a good thing or a bad thing because if John Mitchell does defend takedowns, Kazuba's going to gas. And this is a five-round fight. This is a championship fight. So we've got to worry about the cardio going into the fourth and fifth round. If John Mitchell is still with it and still dangerous on the feed and Kazuba's looking like he's really started to slow down, that's when things could get a little bit interesting. But my pick is Kazuba on the feet. There's not really a lot of striking because he does literally wrestle almost every second that the fight is on, which can make for a pretty boring watch, to be brutally honest. But... I do believe that we are going to see Jakub, sorry, where I was going was that when Jakub is on the feet, he is very fast. He's got a lot of, he's just very fast when he is on the feet, but he's just going to wrestle. And I think that, that John Mitchell, he's going to have to defend all of those takedowns. And I don't know if John Mitchell can defend takedown after takedown after takedown after takedown. So I'm going to go Jakub Kazuba or Jacob Kazuba. And I'm going to go by decision. I don't really see Jacob getting a finish in this one here just because he doesn't really have a finish heavy style. Like, yes, he did get a renaked choke in his first PFL fight. I believe that was his PFL debut. But he's not the biggest finisher. You will kind of see it in his fighting style on the weekend if you don't look into him yourself. Just a full-on wrestler, not too much sort of ability to find the finish. And now we've got Franz Malambo taking on Khrushchev Kakarov. And I do like Koshi Kakarov in this matchup here. I think stylistically, this is actually quite a good matchup for him. Now, Franz Malambo is a striker, and he fights quite long. And he's quite thin for Bantamweight. You know, he's got kind of like a tall frame, 5'9". But he's quite a thin guy, and he does strike with a lot of... I want to say a lot of smoothness, because that's kind of what he does. He has his hands very, very low. He's very relaxed in the cage in the fight. And he's just very smooth with what he does. Obviously, he'll pop out his strikes and he'll get out of the way. But a big issue with Malambo for me is, man, he keeps his hands pretty low. And he really relies on that movement to defend strikes. He really relies on not just the head movement. He relies on the moving pretty much his whole body to get out of the way of almost every shot that does get in his way. And when he does that, he's not keeping his hands high. He's dropping the hands and leaving the chin exposed. So maybe a really good striker could eventually figure out Malambo, set something up, get Malambo to react to something, and then throw something else that he doesn't expect and really catch him because he does leave that chin up in the air. And he is a guy that does have his hands pretty low. Now, Khrushchev Kakarov is mostly a wrestler, but he can strike. He actually is a pretty solid striker. But what I really like in this matchup for Kakarov is the fact that he is a wrestler because I don't see Malambo defending every takedown that Kakarov is going to be attempting against him. I think that we're going to see as well Kakarov move forward because Kakarov is a very aggressive forward moving fighter and Malambo is a guy that as I said is very relaxed, is very content moving backwards but the issue is if Kakarov is moving forward and cutting off Malambo's movement and not, let, not letting Malambo kind of move around the cages freely as he probably wants to, 
he is going to limit a lot of movement. He is going to limit a lot of defense that Malambo does rely on. I think he could catch Malambo with a KO blow. But I am mostly siding with Kakarov for that wrestling advantage that he is going to have. I think we're going to see Kakarov go out there, get the takedowns over Malambo, and probably land some pretty good shots on the feet. Now, yes, Malambo is awkward, and that really could give Kakarov a lot of problems. But I was really impressed with how Kakarov dealt with Ali Taleb. And that fight looked really good on the feet and in the wrestling. He just showed off a really good all-round game. I think he can do that against a guy like Franz Malambo. So give me Kakarov to win this one here. I do think a KO could definitely be on the cards. But since I am sort of picking Kakarov for the wrestling side of this game, I'm going to side with the decision. But a KO would not surprise me. And now we move on to the main event. Well, I feel like that went pretty quickly for this breakdown. I mean, it is a 13-fight card, but I feel like I got through it relatively fast. Nate Kelly taking on Dimitri Salmeas, and I don't know why this is the main event. Maybe PFL sees something in Nate Kelly that I didn't, because when I looked into it, I saw Nate Kelly was the main event, and I thought, man, like, why? Like, why don't they have Simeon Powell as the main event? Why don't they have a championship fight as the main event? They could probably even have the Code of Achiever headline the card. I don't know. And I thought maybe it was because Nate Kelly was like a big time celebrity. I do see that he trains at SPG Island. So I maybe thought that Conor McGregor was shouting him out all the time. And he had big following online. He doesn't. He's got about 6,000 followers on Instagram, I believe. So he's not like a big name. So maybe the PFL see something big in Nate Kelly. Or they see something in Dimitri Salmeyers. But I don't know. This is an interesting main event when there is championship fights on the line. But I'm sure Nate Kelly is going to make the most of it. Because he is my pick. But this isn't necessarily going to be the easiest fight for him. Because Dimitri Salameyas, I couldn't find a lot of MMA. Sorry, someone just got home as I'm recording that. I couldn't find a lot of MMA tape on Dimitri Salameyas. But what I could find was a bit of kickboxing tape. I saw that I saw somewhere that he had boxing fights, but he doesn't have a box rec, so I don't really know. Dimitri Salameyas, though, is a striker for sure. And he doesn't have any submission wins. He doesn't have any submission losses, though, to his credit. But Nate Kelly on the feet leaves himself very open, man. When he throws strikes, it's almost all hooks. And when you throw a hook, you do leave yourself open. But he's got a lot of power. He's got a lot of aggression behind those hooks as well. He likes to move forward. And not only that, he likes to move forward and get takedowns. And that is what I like in this fight here. He's taking on a guy that does have a somewhat accomplished kickboxing background. That does have, I believe, at least one boxing fight. I don't really know what I saw when I was reading that article. But Nate Kelly, on the feet, I think he could be in trouble. Because, yes, he does look good when he's fighting. Because he is moving forward. But he's bombing away with hooks, man. And you can leave yourself very open if you're just bombing away with hooks. So I think that Nate Kelly is going to get it done using the grappling. And I think he's going to get the takedowns over Dimitri Solomayas. And then eventually get a submission. I do believe he's going to finish Dimitri here. In the main event, an interesting main event, as I did say at the start of the breakdown of that fight. But with all of that being said, that is all of my picks for PFL Europe 2023 Championships. Let me know what you think of this card in the comments below. Will you be watching this card? I will definitely be watching this card. I mean, it's going to be at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, so it's going to be on, I think, at like 5 a.m. in the morning for me. So I'm probably going to miss the prelims live. But I will be able to catch the main card. Let me know what you think in the comments. And I'll see you guys in the next one.